tonight, ruling All Progressives Grand Alliance Afghan wins 15 out of 17 local governments so far released in the Anambra governorship election. Civil society groups monitoring Anambra governorship election describe the exercise as largely free and fair, although some hiccups were noticed. Two more bodies are recovered from the site of the 21-story collapsed building in Ikoi, Lagos, bringing the total death toll to 34. And Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa al khadimi survives drone attack in Baghdad. We begin tonight with the governorship election in Anambra State. Results from the 19 local government areas have so far been declared. And a breakdown shows that all the All Progressives Grand Alliance, APGA, has won 17 of the 19 local government areas. While the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, and the Young Progressives Party have picked up one local government area each. The All Progressives Congress has yet to win any local government area. To get more details of the results, do visit our website www.channelstv.com Although collation of results in the Anambra election was largely peaceful, there was a moment of confusion over the conduct of the exercise in Orumba North local government area with a collation officer stationed at a local government accusing the electoral officer of conniving with thugs to tamper with the results. This allegation was refuted by the electoral officer who in turn slams the collision officer for being incompetent. I'll bring you more on this story as soon as we can. In the meantime, preliminary reports about the conduct of Saturday's governorship election in Number of State have begun a trickling in the convener of the Situation Room and Country Director. Action Aid Nigeria, Mrs. NLB, who spoke in Oka today, notes that the bimodal voter accreditation system failed to function in many local governments' areas, uh, many locations, leading to a delay in the process with ad hoc staff not being able to operate the application. According to her, voting started midday due to late arrival of INEC staff and election materials in some locations with no INEC staff or materials in Ihiala and Idemili local government areas at the time of the exercise when it was supposed to start. Peaceful. This was against the background of potential violence, rhetorics leading to, you know, up to the election. Even though there were pockets of uh, disturbances, but we can, guarantee, can say that generally the election was peaceful. In terms of logistics and commencement of the polls, INEC and ad hoc staff, you know, and election materials arrive late at 67% of the polling units visited by situation room observers. The polls commence early, but voting itself started about 10, between 10 and 12.30 in 53% of the voting locations that was observed. This was as a result of late arrival of, of officials and materials. These delays in the commencement of pools were observed in locations of the polling unit 001 and 008 in the Amansia ward of Oka local government. You also have polling unit 017 and 018 in Uga ward 1 of Agwata local government and several others. In some other places, particularly voting location in Ihiala, Idemili, and Idem Idemili North and Idemili South local government areas, no INEC official or materials were deployed. The bimodal verification accreditation system, BIVAS, although the BIVAS had been used or tested in Isoko South constituency, you know, in the by-election, this would be the first major elect, you know, election test where INEC deployed beavers. 
Residents of a number of states are adopting an expectant posture after the conclusion of the voting exercise yesterday with the report of a peaceful atmosphere in the state. The indigents of the state also noted the presence of security personnel while activities are gradually returning to parts of the state, including the markets following the exercise. Across a number of states, the atmosphere is still calm and peaceful after Saturday's governorship election. The major roads are not so busy in some areas, but more busy in others, indicating that those who may have taken a trip to their local government areas are beginning to return, while business activities have also commenced around Unizik Junction, Oka. The election has left many in a mood of indifference in some parts, while in other areas, what forms the dominant discussion is the election and expectations of the people. Anambra is the first to organize a governorship election in the new technology where, vote, where rigging is impossible. You see what is going to be replicated in the 36 other states. Others maintain that against any negative expectations, Anambra has remained peaceful. In my area, today is our market day. So everybody came out, uh, came, came to the market to get to buy things, unlike yesterday. What I heard about yesterday election, I thought that had even that uh, what was as in what they were, I heard happened. That, that I don't think that we anybody outside today. That everybody will be afraid. But yesterday election, I think I heard it was a peaceful one. From my house, I made calls. You know, to many people I know around Anambra State, uh, from all the four corners of Anambra State, there was no crisis. And that remains till now. Though there is a uh, helicopter over the place, there are soldiers and policemen all over the place, that is okay. But the most important thing is that God took charge of Anambra State. It's an air of anticipation as the final results are awaited to see who will carry the day as the next governor of Anambra State. We can bring you more now on the election as it happened in Urumba North local government area with a coalition officer stationed at the local government accusing the electoral officer of conniving with thugs to tamper with the results. The police crisis, as we got there, there was apparently avoidable, everywhere was calm. His introduction may have begun on a peaceful note, but his words after that is anything but. Accusations of bribery and attempts to rig the elections is what the coalition officer stationed at the Rumba North local government area is aggrieved about. A situation he says could have cost him his life. I worked with her in office. I saw there was vivid presence Please, all around. Remember some of them who they did the election from wherever they came for their money. She refused to pay them their money. Just despite the fact that the money was there. And I told her, I said, Madam, if their money is there, give them their money. Why not give them their money? They will be endangering our lives. I told her, and she would have made me kill as well. Although I've been so traumatized, I couldn't really go into the details. Skeletally, I've made some fact finding on, the, on my case. It's bootrest, everything is summarized here. I have, and I have evidence. You know, the police who came with her can show that I was, it was under duress. If you call some of them, they could find how they surrounded me the whole night after I've been tear gassed by her that caused me the room. I almost collapsed. The accused is the electoral officer sitting beside him. After listening with folded arms, she's given the floor to defend herself. The man here, if you can observe him, please. If you observe this man for 30 minutes, you will know he is not composed. We were watching him. He has said so many things about me. He has never had an experience of a, a, a how to, on how to collect a result. I sense that the, the place was tense up, and that uh, my, for my collation officers, being in their different collation center, could, something else could happen because some were hold, hostage already. I was hearing several reports. 
I have to save their life by telling them to come over to the office. I made I put canopies for them. When he saw them collecting results there from ECHA into ECHB, he said they were conducting election. He does not know the difference between conducting election and collecting election. Party agents lend their voices uh, to the issue. First, the representative of the All Progressive Grand Alliance, Abga, confronts the coalition officer for putting up a story after submitting a documented result. This coalition officer collected this result, signed it, and gave copies to all the party agents. When he was speaking, he said he was forced to sign it. Somebody who is under distress, the way he presented it, could not have collected this result. Very clean copies, no mutilation, nothing. Look at it and see. This is my, my own copy. There was no cancellation there, not even a line. And he signed it and wrote his name. However, the representative of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, wants a thorough investigation conducted. I listened very carefully to what he said, and I was able to distinguish that what he was talking about was that during collation, not during the election, but during the collation, he realized that eight bees were mutilated. So eight C can be a clean copy, but the issue is that it does not disenfranchise the fact that the eight bees were mutilated, and in such a situation. In such a situation, the right thing will have been. Please, sir, can we have peace? In such a situation, the right thing. Agent is... of Abga, please, sir. Can you just allow us to have peace, sir? The right process will have been to call for the 8 A's. And because the, what is mutilated is the 8 B. He could have gone back to collect the 8 A's during the work of what the World Coalition officers ought to have done. Because this will have helped this process and make it more transparent than panic and disagree among themselves. This, the INEC resident officer says, will be looked into. The outcome of the findings is important as observers expect INEC to live up to his word on providing a safe and transparent platform for future elections. The Anambra State Governorship Election Plus. Two more bodies recovered from the site of the 21-story building collapsed in Ikoi. They get the total death toll to 44. Stay with us. Welcome back. If you just joined us to watch the news at 10, coming to you live from Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Ruling All Progressives Grand Alliance, APGA wins 17 out of 19 local governments so far released in an Anambra governorship election. Civil society groups monitoring Anambra governorship election describe the exercise as largely free and fair, although some hiccups were noticed. Death toll from the Ikoi building collapse now stands at 44 as two more bodies are recovered from the site of the 21-story structure. It's a close shave for Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa Al-Kadimi who survived a drone attack in Baghdad. I will get more now on the Anambra governorship election. Our political editor, Shawan Kimalo, is standing by at the Coalition Center in Oka. Shawan. Thank you, Amaji. Welcome to the Coalition Center here in the INEC headquarters in Oka, Anambra State. Well, it's still in activity. That is what we're experiencing right now because the result from Orumana is still being collated and a lot of uh, discrepancies that have been identified have been tabled and uh, party agents are sitting with INEC 
and the RA and the local government officials are looking into the figures. They are tabling all over again. They are realigning the figures all over again. And that's taking several hours now. Um, for almost two and a half hours now, they began that exercise, that process. Um, don't forget that here, our local government, uh, they declared no election in that local government. But for Orumba and Hiala, those are the contentious local government. My two results so far have been turned in. But here at the coalition center, which has become some kind of a media center, because I mean, cameras are all over the room, and journalists, uh, our colleagues across the other stations are also here from newspapers to television, radio. Everybody has their ears and eyes right in this room, waiting for the moment when um, the professor, the vice chancellor, uh, the first female vice chancellor of the University of Calabar comes into the room and began the process again. That is what we're expecting. Uh, to, we're expecting now to be able to give us a head where whether or not we know a winner in this election because those two local governments are critical for us to know uh, who will carry the day and which political party will eventually be declared the winner in this governorship election which started on the 6th of November 2021. Amara. Well, Shen, um, well, they have been announcing those results uh, all day today. Um, so, of course, I know you have a long way to go. Uh, but what, what, what are we hearing really, you know, from Orumba and Ihiala, the, the trouble spots that you mentioned earlier? Yes, for Ihiala, it's uh, a situation where there are complaints by INAC officials that there were resistance, uh, threat to life, threat of violence, and so there are no elections in Ihiala local government area. For in Orumba now is a situation of discrepancy in the figures that have been tabled and tabulated, and that's the reason why they need to realign, um, uh, re recalculate, re-enter the figures so they can, uh, because the party agents had great objections, they had uh, uh, raised issues concerning the figures, and they have to uh, refill it all over again, and those are the contentions between those two local governments. Don't forget, 21 local government areas, 19, but these two local government, obviously, there are no figures for Hiala because it was declared, and no elections. The one that is contentious is Orumba, enough, and so when that result is returned back into this room and announced, then we can say, oh, it's Hiala alone that we are expecting, or elections will be, will be held in that later on, or we don't know what INEC will say in that regard, whether or not this election can be declared conclusive or inconclusive or whatever way INEC will turn into this election is something that we have seen in the past before, especially in Anambra. You remember the Idemili North and Idemili South in the history of Anambra governorship election. It looks like something that is replaying itself, but we leave all of that to INEC to figure out and give us a clear picture of where to go from this very point. Amara. Thank you, Shell, for the updates. I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you as soon as something comes up and uh, uh, they re-emerge, you know, to begin to announce uh, what the decisions are concerning, especially those two local government areas. Our political editor, Shell Kimbaloye from Oka. Nigeria's expenses on the public sector, particularly the political office holders, must drastically reduce if the country is to witness development. The thoughts of elder statesman and former Minister of Petroleum Resources, Chief Philip Asiodu. Chief Asiodu told Channel's Television's Ladi Akredulale on our current affairs program, Newsnight, that the disparity between the highest paid and the lowest paid persons in Nigeria is too wide. It says that there is need for increased discipline in the management of scarce resources. I have also publicly, privately said, given our GDP and per capita, we have to go away from what remunerations people are getting now in the public sector, whether in the assembly or in the executive. And I even said 35 million gross for president. Go down, minimum wage, you raise it to 50,000 a month, 600,000. You improve the salaries of teachers. But all the way down, chief of Senate, 
you know, governance scale down. In the American situation, well, wealthiest number number two economy or number one you know, between there and China. China, yes. You know, president for seventy five, for fifty thousand dollars minimum. I'm talking twenty seventeen minimum wage twenty five. Thirteen to one. Senator, 175, seven to one. Here, when I was in the Presidential Advisory Council, we had to ferret out the information. What information? The Senator was on 212 million a year, constituency allowances, and the normal thing recommended by revenue allocation now minimum wage 216, 988 to one. Of course, if you went to India, this thing. So we cannot, and what I'm saying about public sector, also a price in some private sector, you know, we must please discipline ourselves. You can watch the full interview with Chief Asiodun on Newsnight. It airs tomorrow, Monday, November 8th, 2021, at 9 p.m. right here on Channels Television. The death toll at the Ikoyi building collapse incident in Lagos has risen to 44 as emergency officials uh, continue to work at the site. It is day seven of the building collapse, and our correspondent, Darido, will return to the scene. Here's his report. Additional two male bodies have been recovered at the building club site in Ikui. The death toll now stands at 44 with 15 survivors. With the old 21-story building reduced to scattered iron rods and shattered slabs, emergency management officials are gradually calling it today at the site. They're clearing the debris and possibly running the final laps of the operation here. The scene is also gradually becoming less crowded, but there are a few onlookers still around to catch a glimpse of the ongoing work at the site. Lagos State Emergency Management Agency, LASEMA, has pulled down the estate entrance structure in a controlled demolition exercise. They say it is considered weak and may potent another danger. The two other high-rise buildings beside the one that caved in on that fateful day are left untouched. As agencies of government continue their work into the night and maybe into another day, Dari Idu, Channels Television News. A number of children orphaned or separated from their parents by the insurgency in Borno State currently stands at 54,000. As the Borno State government aims to shut down all internally displaced persons camps in the capital city by December this year, the fate of these children hangs in the balance. An next report examines the future of the plight of these children in light of the development. This duck will rage at any attempt to separate her from her ducklings. This is a luxury that thousands of orphaned children in Borono State are not enjoying. The 12 years of Boko Haram insurgency has separated at least 54,000 children from their parents, which has forced them to live with relatives. In one of the camps in Maiduguri, this husband and wife, who are in their 70s, are raising their six orphaned grandchildren, a responsibility imposed on them by the insurgency. Mubarak was barely five years old when he was brought to Dallary IDP camp. He has no memories of his parents or the circumstances under which he was separated from them. Now, it appears he is uncertain of his education. 
This learning facility was built for orphans and children affected by the insurgency. Though the children are drawn from Adamawa, Borno, and Yobe states, some of those who have benefited from the center are from the Dallary camp. As the insurgents know, they Karam, they attack us, and then we came out from our houses, and the, the women would tell us to take us to camp, and then vice president opened the school and they took us here, and you know, we are in jail. Here we have available teacher every day. We have our teachers. In one week, we will have uh, only one teacher will come and teach us something. But here, we have every day teachers are coming teaching us. However, the facility can only accommodate 525 children, which is less than 1% of the total number of affected children. Here in Meduguri, you have the Osibanjo um, Orphan School, you have uh, the Aisha Buhari. Future Achuat School, where um, children from the IDP camps, children who are orphans, have been enrolled, and the state government is bankrolling all the expenses as it concerns these children. The Kano state government has adopted a hundred orphans, a gesture that the Borno state government is not taken for granted. Rather, the state government hopes to set a community-based structure that ensures the children, especially those raised by the elderly, do not become stranded at some point. When the news of 10 returns, road accident in Taraba State leaves seven people dead. Welcome back to the News at 10. Residents of Toso and Marogo communities in Kromi local government area of Taraba State have fled their homes following a reported invasion of the communities by soldiers from the Republic of Cameroon. According to residents, the soldiers are searching for fleeing Ambazonian separatists whom they believe could be seeking refuge within the communities. A clear view of Toso and Mirogo villages in Kurmi local government area of Taraba state shows deserted settlements as fleeing residents are taking refuge in neighboring communities. The residents claim the Cameroonian soldiers occasionally cross this river, which is a natural border between Nigeria and Cameroon and their affected communities. I was in my farm. When I saw people running away from their homes, by my right, I saw army. Also by my left, I saw army. I was asking what is the problem. I was told that there are Cameroonian soldiers looking for Ambadonian soldiers who they have been in conflict for a series of years. The best thing I could do is to also join them. I go into my house, I pick my few belongings, I also run away. We relate. Uh, mostly with most of the traditional rulers from Cameroon. So if they have problems uh, with criminals there, they write to us to arrest and hand them over to them. And if we have criminals there to write to them, they will arrest them and give us over. The situation is exacerbating the humanitarian situation in the area as residents take refuge in camps for internally displaced persons. Governor Darius Ishiaku promises that the situation is being addressed. I'm very much aware of it and we are working on it. They won't get to the level we are fearing. I've already started tackling it. This situation borders on the territorial integrity of Nigeria and the residents here are hoping that the relevant authorities will act fast and give the residents a sense of belonging. Staying in Taraba State, seven people have been reported dead following a ghastly motor accident involving an 18-seater bus. The accident occurred hours into the early hours of Saturday and is believed to have been caused by a tire burst, which made the driver apply the brakes on the speeding vehicle, leading to a somersault. 
Tonight, we continue to examine the fine details of the proposed 2022 budget of the federal government of Nigeria. A focus is on the budget of the Ministry of Works and Housing. Data and information consultant, Babajide Ogusovo, is our guide as always. Babajide, great to have you here. Good evening. I'm Archie. Well, good evening. It's orange today. Now, in the last three weeks, you have been discussing, you know, the budgets for the Ministry of Health. You talked about the one for defense and then education. Now we're looking at works and housing. What's unique about this one? Lots of unique things. I'd like to start with reminding you that what we've seen with this works and housing um, budget is that every solution to a problem in Nigeria raises new problems. And why do I say so? I'd like us to take a look at the top seven priorities of the government because in front of the top seven priorities allows us to know what the government will be focusing on in its last full year budget. This is the last full year budget the government has. And why we call this the top seven priorities is that excluding monies that will go for debt repayment, excluding money that will go for statutory transfers, these top seven ministries account for 40% of all government's planned spending for next year. So these seven ministries, 4.5 trillion naira budget, we've talked about education, we've talked about defense, we've talked about health. Every solution to a problem raises new unsolved problems. So what do I mean? Defense now is being budgeted in trillions of naira. What has, the implication is that education, health, works and housing, now has less money available to be spent. But tonight, here's the interesting thing. Works and housing, 481 billion naira. Part of the top seven ministries, and those are the part of the top seven things that, that the government wants Nigerians to judge them on as it implements its full, full year budget. So it will be interesting to see how much of this money is appropriated and how much eventually is released for works to be carried out. Well, it doesn't seem that that will be enough. The Minister for Works and Housing says that the country needs trillions of Naira, not the billions that have been budgeted, though. Um, so you've done some research on this. What have you seen? So, yes, um, he's right. Um, the country needs trillions of Naira. But tonight, if we're to use works and housing and power, you know, in 2016, these three units were under... Um, the minister then, Babatunde Pashola, if we were to use works, housing, and power as a proxy, here's what you'll notice. There's some good news and there's bad news. The good news is, yes, we've seen the largest works and housing and power bu budget, 783 billion naira. That's the good news. There's even more good news. For housing this year, we have 26 billion naira planned for housing. And also we've seen these ministries make adequate provisions for their multilateral projects, especially Abuja, to Kefia, Kwanji, and Lafia. So that is the good news. Here is the bad news, Amarachi. First, in 2022, the proposed budget for the Ministry of Works, Housing, and Power, that is $783 billion, but that is only 5% of the total budget. Let's look at the budget of 2018. Even though the 2018 budget was $715 billion, it was 8% of the total budget. In other words, yes, we see more money allocated to infrastructure, but in relative terms, based on the size of the budget, it's less money. The second bad news, Amarachi, is that in 2018, Works Power and Housing had a budget of 715 billion naira. But the fact based on inflation shows that what 715 billion naira will buy you in 2018 is more than what 783 billion naira will buy you. So in real terms, the 2018 budget of 715 billion naira has more value for money compared to that 783 billion naira proposed for works, housing, and power next year. And did anything change, you know, with the splitting of the of the ministry itself, you know, power it used to be power, works and housing, but now it's power on its own, and then you have works and housing. So, you know, that question, I think it, that should be for Nigerians to ask, and that's why I also believe that when ministries are creating their budgets, they need to have not just zero-based or whatever type of budget, they need to have fact-based budget. And by fact-based budgets, we're saying ministries need to do more surveys. 
you need to ask citizens questions on what are the challenges they face and how do citizens rate and rank their performance. Until we start having fact-based budgets, we'll keep having these issues whereby we see budgets having some duplicated um, roles and we not being able to really know what exactly is going on. That is one. The second is, if we are to disaggregate these budgets, looking at works and housing and looking at power, you'll see that nothing significant has changed in numerical terms. So let's take a look at the disaggregated budget of works, housing, and power. And if we're able to focus on it, here's what you will notice. In 2020, when that split happened, works and housing had a budget of 280 billion naira. The 2022 budget for works and housing now is 482 billion naira. So in two years, we've seen the works and housing budget grow by approximately 200 billion naira. Power has moved from 133 billion naira in 2020 to 301 billion naira, so about 170 billion naira. In all, we've seen a combination of works, housing, and power move from a budget of 413 billion naira in 2020 to 783 billion naira, what it is today. So, summary is in terms of the split of money to works, power, and housing. The priority has still been on works and housing, but the growth of additional funds has been pretty much the, the same. But again, let's not forget, just like the, the minister said, Minister of Works and Housing, that is not just the budget, Amrachi. It is how much money is released to back the budget. And based on even his own statements, he said that this year, the 2021 budget, just approximately half of all what was budgeted in 2021 has been released. So we, we, don't, we don't no longer just need budgets, Amrachi. We need money-backed <laughs> budgets. And that's just what it is. Remember how we started. Yeah. Every solution to a problem in Nigeria raises new oh, no, problems. No, 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 no. Yeah, and I'm sure that the minister's words were, uh, are quite true for other ministries as well. Thank you so much. For that we'll today. continue next week. Of course. <laughs> and now to the arts. A mixed media artist, Olu Amoda, presents his fifth solo exhibition at Art 21, a co-hotel and suites, Lagos, titled Carte Blanche. In this latest show, which took him over three years to put together, this artist combines repurposed materials in creating these sculptural works. On our review tonight, we take a look at his recent body of works and the message he intends to communicate. Carte Blanche, that's the title of this solo exhibition by renowned mixed media artist Olua Moda at the Echo Hotel Art 21, a space for contemporary art. Combining repurposed materials like mild steel objects, nails and wood, the artist invites the audience to engage with sculptural works clad in social and political layers. Every work you have produced here uh, self-reference what you experience either as a kid or as an adult and as an urban artist I'm informed by what I read and listen to in the news. His seminal body of work Sunflower explores the connection between mass industry and was the organic winning top prize at the 2014 Duck Art Biennial in Senegal while the large work recently done is titled Ruga explores the cattle rearing in the past and present times. When I started reading and listening to news about the slaughtering of people, the number of people, you know, how cattle rearers move from your sticks to using AK-47, you know, as one of their tools to guide their tool, you see the cattle. That is not what I used to see as a kid. So there's some kind of shock. 
will I say cultural shock or a social shock, you know, to see Caturreras with AK-47. While I'm not dwelling on that, I'm also looking at how I can use those elements and bring them into my work. You know, so if you look at the detail of those work, you probably will see bullets, you know, that is define the perimeter of a, the Nigerian map. So the country is under siege. So I use those bullets to point to the the seed nature of the country. This latest collection took over three years to complete, and this is Olu Amoda's fifth solo exhibition at Art 21. Well, here on the News at 10, we're still monitoring the election collation of results as well as announcement from Anambra State. Uh, we'll be bringing you live pictures. There they are. Uh, live pictures at the scene at the collation center itself, beg your pardon, in Oka, the Anambra State uh, capital. Earlier, we spoke to our uh, political editor, Shomoke Maloui, who is right at the scene, uh, giving us updates. So still awaiting the INEC resident electoral commissioner uh, with more updates on the collation of results and especially what happens to Orumba North and Idemili, uh, local government areas of Anambra State. In the meantime, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo would be representing President Muhammadu Buhari at an extraordinary summit of the ECOWAS Authority of Heads of State and Government today in Accra, Ghana, on the political situation in the republics of Guinea and Mali. In a statement by the Vice President spokesman, Laulua Konde, today's extraordinary meeting, which will be the third on the same agenda this year, will assess previous resolutions and further review the political situation in the republics of Guinea and Mali. The Vice President had participated in the second ECOWAS Extraordinary Summit on the political situation in Guinea and in Mali, held on September 16th in Accra, Ghana. ECOWAS leaders in the communique issued at the end of the last special summit in Accra, amongst other resolutions, decided to freeze the financial assets of members of the military junta, place a travel ban on them, while also demanding that the junta return Guinea to constitutional rule within six months. To the economy, the commercialization of the genetically modified pest-resistant cowpea is generating positive response from farmers as they continue to attest to significance for job creation and poverty reduction. A country coordinator of the Open Forum for Agricultural Biotechnology in Africa, Dr. Rose Guidado, who was speaking at a meeting in Abuja, explains that the improved variety has the potential of making Nigeria attain its vision for food security and help farmers raise their income. Key players from the agricultural biotechnology sector from Nigeria and international agencies are meeting to build a public-private partnership for food and nutrition security in Africa. Speakers after speakers bear their minds on the need for farmers to accept the newly introduced technology, demystifying beliefs about the hazards that this new technology may bring. Every state in the country um, has 32 farmers you know, uh, that have established demonstration plots on their fields. And aside from others who bought the seeds and are planting commercially, and then to develop effective agricultural extension support and services to accelerate the adoption of this crop. We are standing here as professionals, uh, indeed professional experts, to tell Nigerians that their claims are not only wrong, but they are anti-progressive. They are also anti-nationalistic. And indeed, it, they are, it, it is hypocritical to the aspirations of the Nigerian people who need more food to feed her teeming population and alleviate the poverty of her numerous smallholder farmers. A farmer who is already taking steps to improve his yield in cowpea production assures of its potential, while an expert also seeks the acceptance at all levels. The new GMO innovation is a good one. It's a breakthrough 
for Nigerian, particularly Nigerian food security scheme. And it can assist farmers when there is intensive, continuous sensitization and mobilization of small older farmers at the local level. The conventional crop it does not give you as much yield as this. This gives you know 20% increase in yield and then 37% reduction in pesticide use. So it's actually um, it enhances food security. The federal government says food security is critical to the existence of a nation, and so the adoption of this improved technology may just be a step in the right direction towards achieving this feat. Fiona shows now tens of thousands of Ethiopians today rallied in Mescal Square in the capital, Addis Ababa, in support of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's government as federal troops fight rebellious forces were threatening to march on the city. Some of the demonstrators denounced the United States, which is among foreign powers that have called for a ceasefire as a year-long war that has killed thousands of people intensified amid rebel advances last week. Mr. Abiy's government has pledged to keep fighting. It said on Friday the government had a responsibility to secure the country and called on international partners to stand with Ethiopia's democracy. Conflict in the north of the country started a year ago when forces loyal to the TPLF seized military bases in the Tigray region. In response, Mr. Abiy sent troops who initially drove the TPLF out of the regional capital, Mekele, but have faced a sharp reversal since June this year. Iraq's Prime Minister Mustafa al kadimi says he escaped a drone attack on his home inside Baghdad's high-security green zone. Officials say a drone laden with explosives struck the building, injuring six of his bodyguards in an apparent assassination attempt. The drone laden with explosives was targeted at the Prime Minister's residence. The military says it is an attempted assassination. The Prime Minister escaped unhurt. Shortly after reports of the attack, Prime Minister Kadimi reassured on social media that he had not been harmed. Two government officials said Kadimi's residence had been hit by at least one explosion and confirmed that the Prime Minister was safe. Western diplomats based in the Green Zone, which houses government buildings and foreign embassies, said they heard explosions and gunfire in the area. The attack, which according to security sources, injured several members of Kadimi's personal protection detail. It came after protests in Iraq's capital over the result of a general election last month turned violent. Images published by the state news agency showed damage to some part of the prime minister's residence and a damaged SUV vehicle parked in the garage. Remains of a small explosive laden drone used in the attack were retrieved by security forces to be investigated. No group has yet claimed responsibility for the attack. Soon after the attack, the government released a video showing the Prime Minister chairing a meeting with security commanders to discuss the drone attack. A citizen condemnation for the attack is President Baram Saleh, who said on social media, we cannot accept that Iraq will be dragged into chaos and a coup against its constitutional system. In sports news, Nigerian nightmare Kamaru Usman has retained his welterweight title after beating Colby Covington in their grudge rematch in New York. Usman beat Colby on the judges' scorecards 48-47, 48-47, 49-46 in the main event of UFC 268 at Madison Square Garden. Usman, who has now picked up 15 straight wins, says he is not interested in moving up to the middleweight division to face Israel Adesanya unless the UFC president is ready to stump up the cash. A 34-year-old retraced the two Nigerians with two belts is better one Nigerian with two belts. 
Mikel Arteta celebrated his 100th game as Arsenal manager with a 1-0 victory against 10-man Watford earlier today as the resurgent Gunners were climbed to fifth in the Premier League. Emil Smith-Rowe broke the deadlock in the second half after an inspired performance from Watford goalkeeper Ben Foster that frustrated the hosts with Ura. Yuraj Kuka dismissing late on the Emirates Stadium. Antonio Conte's first Premier League game in charge of Tottenham ended in a goalless draw with Everton at Goodison Park. The video assistant referee ruled out a second half Leicester goal as the Foxes share the points with Leeds in an entertaining game at Elan Road. Others just in motorists along Lagos Ibado Expressway have been urged to exercise restraint and patience uh, as heavy traffic resulting from the obstruction on the Shagamu interchange has been noticed tonight. A tanker laden with 50,000 litres of automotive gas oil, also known as diesel, has uh, gutted, been gutted by fire causing the disruption. The Nigeria Emergency Management Agency says it has contacted the Ogun State and Federal Fire Services to file out to the scene. NEMA calls the motorists not to resort to unsecured routes while trying to seek alternative access at this time. And just to remind you again, our lead story tonight, uh, we're still waiting more from the collation centre in Oka, a number of states following yesterday's election. Our correspondent is on the ground uh, waiting for the INEC resident commissioner uh, to give updates, especially for Orumba North and Idemili local government areas. And the main news again. Ruling All Progressives Grand Alliance, APGA, has won 17 out of 19 local government areas so far released in the Anambra governorship election. Thanks for watching tonight. I'm Amarachi Mbani.